Good evening, everyone. I'm Tom Kalaga of the New York Times. Welcome to tonight's Times Talks with Karen O oh and Danger Mouse. We've just heard three songs from their new album, Lux Prima. And if that wasn't terrific enough, we're now privileged to hear the lead singer of the Yeah, Yeah, Yeahs and the Grammy Award-winning producer discuss their mutual admiration and their collaboration, 11 years in the making. Joined by the chief pop music critic of the New York Times, John Perellis, please welcome back to the stage, Karen O and Danger Mouse. I just want to say how privileged I feel to have heard that. That's so beautiful. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, but well, let's talk about this album. I mean, you had been contemplating collaborating for a long time, apparently involving alcohol at some point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Drunk dial. Yeah, we met, I think we played a show, at the same show in 2004, I think. It was... Uh, yeah, yes, Iggy Pop, and then I was supposed to DJ, and uh, I thought I would impress them. And when I got there, I played two records. I said, "We're just it. We're good. We're done." So I never, I never did actually meet them, but I, I think I met Nick. But that was the first time we were in the same kind of vicinity. But I don't think we talked for another couple of years. And then you drunk dialed. Then I drunk dialed. Yeah, <laughs> which I, neither of those things I have any recollection of the drunk dial or the Iggy Pop show. So. Um, but yeah. that's, yeah, that was the old days. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you, when you started this, did you walk into it thinking about a sound? Did you think about an idea? Did you think about all of those things? We hadn't talked about it at all. We just kind of, you know, we knew each other. We'd been around each other. We had, long, we had a couple of long drunken talks in person. <laughs> but we, we never really, no, we didn't know what kind of record it was going to be. I didn't know if it was going to be her album, if it was going to be our album, if it was going to be a group name. We didn't, we didn't talk about any of that until probably halfway into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We didn't, yeah. We, just, we just waited till we had time, which we both never really had, and then when we did, we just jumped on it and started making stuff. So you set out a block of time and said, come kind to my of, studio? Kind of. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember you, I remember you came to New York and you were pregnant, mm -hmm. and you said you might have some time free because of this. <laughs> and, and that maybe after I that, that a lot of time for yeah, you. yeah, you could nobody would question it, and so maybe we could slip in there. And I thought, well, I mean, that, it worked out. So yeah. that's that was the only real like definitive thing we ever really did was that first week or two, and we didn't know if it was going to work out or what it was going to be like. But that's the first thing we did. So you sat in a room and you're at a keyboard and you're. Thinking about singing tunes? Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, you were on the keyboard, and, and then, like, yeah, and I was kind of listening, and, and just, like, melodies popping into my, into my brain, basically. Um, yeah, so yeah, I mean, that. so we, we went in with nothing. We don't, uh, I like to write songs in the moment, in the spot of, because I feel like if both people can see each other being terrible and tell each other no really quickly, <laughs> you can get to a comfortable place, and then you can start to really trust and believe the other person. I mean, I, like, I love her music, but it's just getting to that point. So I like to just start there, even if eventually it turned into, hey, can you just bring some good stuff because we don't have it? But initially, that's what we did. And the first day, I think we messed around for maybe two or three hours just listening to stuff until we finally, like, all right, we'll just go in. Because neither one of us is comfortable playing instruments um, <laughs> at all. As you might have. I was going to say, as you can see, I, I don't it was think a I looked up once. when he made his uh, solo work. So yes. Was, yes. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah. Um, but, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, yeah. then it just turned, the first song just turned into this 10 minute uh, long first song on the album. And that was the first one you wrote? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 The first the four first days, one. maybe. Yeah. Wow. So, so what was your reaction walking in? Um, yeah, no, I mean, I was super excited because, yeah, just like a deep uh, respect for Brian and his work. And, um, and, yeah, I just didn't, like, I just had, like, a high anticipation of, you know, just getting to collaborate with somebody new on, no, some, with, with somebody new on something new. And, um, and uh, but I didn't really, yeah, I just didn't really know what to expect necessarily. 
Um, and yeah, like we had, a, we kind of knew each other, but we didn't really know each other. And really, yeah. kind of the beginning of us working together was like us getting to, to know each other as well and trust each other. Um, uh, but you know, uh, yeah, like I had just a lot of, yeah, he impressed me right away because um, he had worked with some of the biggest rock titans of um, you know me being around, and he's been, he was able to tell them. No, that that single that's not a single so <laughs> to like to like some of the biggest people in rock and if you could say that to someone like I was like man that takes some serious like that takes so like yeah that takes some guts man so like so um so I just trusted his like his his uh his opinion right away and um and uh was excited you know that I yeah I could be in a, working with someone who like you know who would tell me who would keep me in check if I was on the wrong path and stuff <laughs> But like, but outside of that, also, I, I you know, I kind of just, um, yeah, I just kind of considered Brian like, uh, sort of like, I guess, like in a way, like a sort of classic, you know, producer. Like that, they don't. There's just not that many of them around anymore. You know, um, his like sort of, uh, I guess, his sort of respect and 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 love for for you know, the art form of songwriting and production is like at an extremely high level and. And like kind of harkens back to like some of my favorite, I guess you know, music from the '60s and '70s, and and so like I yeah so like I was in the you know uh, I guess that's a big influence on on my songwriting too. So I was just extremely excited to you know to dive in. Yeah. Yeah. Were, were you surprised at what came out? I mean, because because I was I was doing my rock critic thing on the album, and you've got spirituality in there. Yeah. You've got um, sexuality, yeah. you've got um, woman is an anthem of yeah. like personal power. Right. I mean, we, we, and I mean, as you write lyrics, were you surprised to see these things tumbling out? Um, yeah, I kind of was. Yeah, because I, I mean, writing music is is like such a you know purely sub to unconscious like process for me, and like. And um, I guess I must have felt like it was a really safe space, you know, um, to to just like to to explore and to really go deep inside, and also just like take it, you know, as far as I wanted to go. And like that was kind of an amazing thing. Working with Brian was that he was just like he rarely said, you know, like no to my like sort of crazy ideas. It was more like well, no is to the sort of like less crazy, maybe more mundane ideas even. So like so. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, he was just totally up for it, you know, which is like really exciting as an artist to work with producer who, who's like that, you know. So. Well, I mean, one one thing about your career, Brian, is um, some producers give the line, "Oh, I just want to bring out the best in the artist," you know. I'm just, you know, a, a facilitator, and you've always rejected that. You said, "I want yeah. the mind meld." Well, yeah, because I'm a fan first, so it's more the idea of hearing what I want to hear. It's not that I want to necessarily make it, but it's, it's really just I trust more what comes in than what I do coming out, putting out. So if I can hear stuff coming in and I know it and it feels right, it feels good, I'm sure of it. And that's where my confidence is. The minute it starts going, yeah, but I wrote the song about so-and-so, I'm like, I don't care. It doesn't feel any. I don't feel <laughs> it. I don't feel something. It doesn't matter. So if someone says they want to make this new record because, it, because and then they start telling me why, None of that affects me the way I just hear it or feel it in a certain way. And even some of my favorite music, probably only half of it really makes me feel that way. I mean, as far as favorite artists and things like that. So, yeah, I don't usually want to just do that because I don't think I'd be very good at it. That's all. I think there's a lot of really great producers and there's, there's definitely stuff I've turned down or didn't work with because I heard demos or things like that and I heard the finished thing and it's way better than what I heard and I could never have done anything with it because it's just, I didn't understand it or didn't feel it. So I have a kind of a smaller kind of, I, I guess I have a smaller uh, bubble of what really <laughs> affects me and I work a lot so maybe there's a pattern or something like that. Well, I once talked to Brian Eno and he said one of his great skills is knowing when to say no. I don't like that, just like, yeah. and it seems like you have that same quality control aspect. Yeah, just it just comes from insecurity. Like I don't. I mean, <laughs> it's just straight up. You know, when you're just, you don't want to embarrass yourself. I don't sing, so I know not to do that. And so, if you're doing stuff, you just, if you stand by something, you have to 
feel like it feels good. I mean, people don't like it after that, then at least you know you can just say they have bad taste or you don't like them or whatever. <laughs> but, you, but if you know it didn't feel right and then you let it out there or it didn't feel good and you listen to some other reason or some other thing and then it's just it's just no point. It's just you know it's just not enough time. So yeah, not for me. Karen, I wanted to ask you about singing because you have a gigantic voice and you have a small. Um, straight from the heart voice as well. Mm -hmm. And you go to both extremes on this album. Um, yeah. is, is that, it just comes out of me when I need it or is that I'm thinking about who my sound is? Um, yeah, it's like, yeah, I feel like I've had this sort of like, this like, for lack of a better word, like this sort of split personality from the very beginning. <laughs> like um, John did like, yeah, we like initially talked um, after our first EP um, yeah, yes, yeah, for CP, um, and uh, and I just did like a interview about that, um, and I felt like Bang was like <laughs> like and on, on that EP there's like a song called Bang and there's a song called Our Time, and I felt like from the very beginning there's like that sort of representation of, of those two sides of me, extremely vulnerable, like you know like kind of like very uh, sort of from the heart, you know heart on the sleeve, like you know essence, and then like. And then, like, the, like, you know, um, sort of warrior, like, bratty, you know, kind of, you know, badass, like, I will, you know, forge the way for, like, all, you know, you know, all other badasses sort of <laughs> on the other side of it. So, like, I feel like that's been in place, like, from the beginning. And, like, and so, I don't know. Yeah, maybe it's just, like, it's just my music, my, like, my sort of my um, singing personality or something, you know. But, um, but yeah, but I, um, they, the two sides always seem to come out, you know. And, and um, I was exploring that, but I was also I feel like I was exploring different um, sort of different vocal styles than I had ever done before on this record. Um, uh, who's the lead singer of the Zombies again? It's um, Colin Bunstone. What? Uh, Colin Bunstone. Bunstone. Colin Bunstone. Bunstone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause um, yeah, like I had a cold for like a lot of these sessions because I have a you know toddler and stuff, and I'm just like all the time. <laughs> and like um, and so I had like a sort of like a little bit of like this like. Someone, you know, told me Colin Blundstone, um, or maybe I read it somewhere. Who knows? Um, but like, but just you know, his his the way he sings, it's like they say, oh, it's just, it sounds like he just ro rolled out of bed and and started singing with this sort of sleepy, like sort of sexy voice or something like this. And um, and like, I guess I thought when I had a cold, like um, it was like a similar <laughs> situation. So I was like trying to work that angle um, and like <laughs> sing with that sort of sleepier, you know, kind of, yeah. Anyway, I was trying some different styles like that, you know, just trying to emulate some of my, some um, some of the, yeah, the singers that I really liked back in, from back in the day, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's, I, I, you've done all these collaborations and one-offs, because I think people really want that natural sound. Um, is, is that natural sound something you have to construct, or is that... Just lucky, I guess. I think it's just, yeah, you know, um, I think it's just, it's, it's funny because, um, yeah, like I, I never trained, like my best friend growing up, um, Veronica Fillman, uh, she, <laughs> she took um, voice lessons from like, you know, from, from like the age of seven throughout high school. And, um, and uh, yeah, and like I just like, I, yeah, I, I never knew how to sing. And then, you know, when I was in high school, I'd just ride around in my car and, and um, listen to, like, Neutral Milk Hotel um, and <laughs> belt it out, like, and also Neil Young. Like, I just, they just had such strange, like, sort of, I was like, wow, like, their voices are weird, but, like, there's so much, like, feeling in them, and, like, and they're just singing their heart out, and, like, so I would just sing my heart out with them. And, uh, and I think, like, maybe that, you know, for whatever reason, my voice, um, like, yeah, like, it just has, like, it, it can pen penetrate, you know, emotionally somehow, you know, it just has, like, an emotional, like, resonance to it, um, and, uh, yeah, that's not, that's not something I can take credit for, I just feel like it's just something that just was gifted to me to a certain degree, yeah. That's, that's what I had heard when we first met and we started talking, I think it was after the phone call, uh, we, you sent me... Uh, Crush the, the the demos for Crush songs, right, which was yeah. years before they came out, but I had never really heard her sing that way. I think that was the thing that I felt had, for myself anyway, like you said, I'm kind of greedy. I want to make a certain type of record or something like that. I heard so much uh, the dynamic 
quality of where she could go and all those things. I was really, really excited about doing something like that. And, but it was, that wound up coming out on its own and I asked her to do some project with me. She said no to that too. So we both said no first and then eventually <laughs> did this. Yeah. I'm glad you worked it out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you, you both talked about Lux Prima as an album, yeah. um, as, as, you know, not singles and filler. Um, I mean, were you thinking of it from the beginning as, as an arc, as a full, ex I mean, it does circle around. It, it, it is, it should be on vinyl. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I don't think we, we didn't plan it out. No. I think we, when we were doing the last song, which was towards the end, we didn't know it was the last song, but it felt like it was the last song. And then it just turned into it. It just turned into the last song and felt like, well, maybe this had been a, over a year of working together. So we thought maybe wrap it up anyway, but that was definitely uh, for us, it, it kind of showed that it could be this kind of conceptual thing. And lyrically, it already started to, to do that with Karen writing the lyrics. It had already started to have a little bit of a, of a concept to it. She knows much more about it than I do. But yeah, yeah, actually, I should shout out to my husband, Barnaby, because um, he, he's, like a, he's like an avid music fan. And he was like, yeah, you know, that last song, I feel like you should like make it really like, like kind of like connect to the first song. <laughs> like, so when it so, starts over again, yeah, it sounds like, so like it's it felt like almost seamless. Yeah. And, um, and he's like the whisperer and like, and so I feel like it just like it got in there and then that last song just kind of did that. And I'm really happy it did because it feels like, you know, like, yeah, it just kind of seamlessly goes from the last to the first, you know, song. But yeah, again, it was just, you know, um, it was, it was cool to, approach this record like totally like outside of well you know we just we just really you know it was it was completely outside of any expectation there's no like no one knew when we were, hardly anyone knew we were doing it you yeah know? yeah so, like, there was so, there was no label there was nothing like that so like yeah. we had the freedom to like make an album and not like a bunch of single oh, a couple singles or a single with like <laughs> a bunch of filler <laughs> so so it was really like you know it was for the love of the of the craft of of making an album you know so yeah Turned out pretty well. Oh, thank you. Um, the, um, you, uh, I, I, I'm sure everybody's wondering, what's the status of the yeah, yeah, yeahs? <laughs> we're still, yeah, we're, we're alive and well. Um, <laughs> don't worry. Um, but yeah, like, uh, you know, I'm just sort of, this has been kind of in the pipeline for, for like the last couple, like, you know, year and a half, and just been like kind of uh, trying to, focus on getting this out, out there into the world. And, and yeah, and 2020 is like pretty open right now. So <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Keep that calendar open. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, you, you've spoken about feeling, feeling relief when the AAS contract ended. Yeah. That you'd like, that he, it seemed that you had internalized kind of the pressure to make a single, to do a banger, to do all those kind yeah, of things. Yeah, I had no idea like until like after we were kind of, yeah, we were free of any contracts, like the sort of, yeah, just sort of like, yeah, um, subconscious weight that was on my shoulders. Like I kind of, when that ended, I was like, man, I feel like a million dollars. Why do I feel like a million dollars? Um, but like, but yeah, it was, it was, uh, you know, um, it was nice to just, you know, to, to not have that. It was like, I don't know, I just kind of like felt like I was on like a bit of a, uh, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to say like a, like a hamster wheel. Yeah, <laughs> I don't want to say hamster wheel, <laughs> but like, but like, but um, but yeah. I mean, it just was nice to like to not have that pressure per se, um, and like and know that like you know um, next time that we get together and make music, it's gonna be like similar, like purely out of like the sort of spirit of collaboration and getting together to make you know something special and without the pressure per se. Yeah. So. No, yeah, and I think it's hard for artists sustaining a career to to just not internalize all those board meetings, all of those, you know, notes from the executive vice president, charge of marketing, whatever. Um, yeah. You don't get notes on records though, no, do you? We, we, no, we, yeah, we did, a, we, yeah, we were pretty lucky. They like kind of, they left us alone, you know, for the most part, they just kind of let us do our own thing and stuff. Um, uh, but like, uh, but yeah, no, I think it's just like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know, it was weird. It was just, um, it was, it's hard to put my, my finger on what made that like, you know, pressure, I don't know. It just felt like a weird pressure that's kind of lifted now. So, yeah, yeah, well, I'm glad you feel freer. Yeah, yeah, getting free, getting free, yeah. <laughs> can I, if I can talk a little more about the yeah, yeah, yeahs. Well, I mean, one of the things I loved about Fever to Tell um, was 
the mayhem in it. Oh yeah. Um, and and you were making mayhem with limitations because you just had the three instru two instruments right, and right, you. Right. I mean, was that was that a conceptual thing you brought to the album, or was that how it turned out when you were writing the songs? Um, yeah, there was one point where there was like. I just love that album. I'm sorry. Oh, thank no, 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 please. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't be here today without that without that record. Um, um, no, actually, the, at one point there was like six of us in the band, so <laughs> <laughs> um, and that was going terribly, and we almost broke up. And then we're like, um, we're, then Nick and I were just sort of let's just bring it back just to you and I, because we had um, a friend who was uh, who knew somebody who was booking the Mercury Lounge, and like, and and he had set us up with this gig. So like, you know, whether or not we were ready, we were supposed to play this gig and it was opening up for the White Stripes like in the year 2000 or whatever. Um, and, uh, and so- No pressure. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but yeah, and then, and then um, and our, the, the, the gal who's drumming with us, um, she, uh, she was like on another gig that, that, um, that night. So, so I called up my buddy, Brian from Oberlin, you know, who just, he's like living with his parents. He just come back from, from, from college. And I was just like, he was like kind of the best drummer, you know, at, at Oberlin. And I was just like, can you just do this one gig with us? And because we just needed to get something together for it. And he did. And then it was just like magic. It was like the chemistry was there. And that was just like, you know, basically it from then on. We were just like, it just is just the three of us. And then, you know, and just kind of that was the, that was the alchemy. Yeah. So l l lucky, pick your college as well. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, you're, you're, you're mounting a giant production with this album. Can yes. you talk a little about that? Yeah, do you want to talk a little bit? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to explain, but I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll try. We don't want to give too much away, even though it's not real, and most people are not going to get to see it. It's small. It's, it's, so it's this, uh, we're calling it it's, an encounter. It, an yeah. encounter. I keep, uh, it's, an, it's kind of an art exhibition, kind of a installation, installation yeah. art installation for sound, but also visual. That thing was when we made the album, um, we were doing a lot of listening because it wasn't a band. So we were making out music that we wanted to listen to ourselves. We make stuff to try to listen to it instead of to try to play it. Um, and we kept doing that as we were making it. And then towards the end, uh, Karen, myself, and, and, and and Barnaby uh, talked a lot about this too, was how we were listening to it. And well, we didn't want to tour it. We, at least we said we weren't going to. And, but how could we uh, have it so people could listen to it the way we were trying to have it listened to? Um, and then some idea came and we bought some like 25,000 pound rock. <laughs> and it's in the artwork. It's this big like kind of monolith mm -hmm. thing. And it had to do with uh, how we were going to all be communally sitting around listening to this thing and doing all these speakers. And next thing you know, there was like 15 people in the room. There, were, there was lighting people, set designers, <laughs> uh, uh, sound designers. And we were starting to make this thing about it probably a little over a year ago. And just about a week or two ago, we were in this huge room. I guess, you know, if you can imagine a room, I guess maybe... 80 feet high, 100 by 100, this massive room with speakers all around and all around the outsides and speakers in the middle and this big monolith thing. And we're listening to the album and we're mixing it where there's strings here and choirs here and all this stuff here. And this was kind of how we thought this would be an amazing way to listen to this album um, the way we want to hear it instead of having to go out there and try to misrepresent you know, what we were trying to do for a year in the studio. Put a studio record into Yeah, it just wasn't going to happen. But like, but yeah, but I, you know, I, I you know, it's, it's just funny because like, I feel like, you know, we're, we've been working in studios for like the last like 15, 20 years. And we've like, we take kind of for granted that we listen to music, you know, on like the sort of like the most high kind of fi, like loud, loud yeah. amazing, you know, kind of like sound systems in these studios. Um, and get to experience music like that. A lot of, I think, majority of people don't get to really experience like music, you know, as it was like, kind of like, you know, like hope to be heard. Um, and, uh, and so we're, so that's like part of like, that was like kind of at the core of what we wanted to do. Like it was like this sort of heightened, 
listening experience with this installation. Um, but like it's in surround sound, so I mean, I've never, I mean, I had never heard music in surround sound before until we started, you know, yeah. mixing it. Yeah, and it's it it's different in a in a bigger room. Like in a small room, it sounds real gimmicky. Something goes here, or there, you sound like you're like you're watching a movie or something. But, and I didn't know when we did this that it would be that different. But it's much much different in a big room when things are coming from different directions. I'm trying to describe it, something. It doesn't, it, it's, it's not gonna, <laughs> you have to, I don't know. That's the idea is you do something hopefully you haven't heard before, but that was the idea. And yeah, and, and that will sort of, you know, the, this record, I think especially just like the production on it and and, the, and like the way that we yeah, wrote the music, it's just like, yeah, it's like quite lush and layered and there's a lot of things like, you know, that you hear when you hear it in that sense, like, and it takes you places. And so, um, so this installation is really, built around just sort of heightening your experience of, of listening to music like with the community and also like you know just kind of like I guess um, evoking all those things that music evoke you know evokes in, in your in your head when you listen to it like we're kind of we're, we're trying to I guess um, yeah just like uh, enhance that around you with like light sound your senses um, yeah maybe some smell and all the sort of things but like but just like really make like the act of listening, this sort of new recreation, and and uh, and maybe like yeah, like yeah, maybe like sometimes like going to concerts like a spiritual experience, right? So like so like if we can achieve, you know, like having this sort of visceral emotional, uh, you know, experience listening to music without actually being there performing it, then you know that would be that would be like that would be huge. But we're sort of aiming towards that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> You're gonna have to uh, seek out 80 foot ceiling rooms in every city. <laughs> well, we'll see how this goes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's might, might, we might have to say no. Yeah. <laughs> um, Karen, you've, you've talked about being a grown up, I guess. And, 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 you know, for, I mean, rock and roll is, you know, youth music, what's left of it. Um, and, um, you, but, you know, you're, you're finding a path. I mean, but but you're thinking about being 40, pardon the expression. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, is it is it a conscious? I mean, are, are you? It's a quest, right? Yeah, like being 40 or. or well, <laughs> well, figuring out what to do as an artist. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, no. Oh yeah, oh yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, you know, it was much worse being 39 than being 40. So. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I can agree on that. <laughs> okay, okay, cool. I think. I've, can you guys hear us on that? Um, but uh, <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I think it's just like for me, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm like, yeah, I'm really uncomfortable being comfortable, unfortunately, which means most of the time um, I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> um, but I like, you know, need to be uncomfortable to like, you know, I need to push myself out of my comfort zone to just feel like joy, you know? So, um, so I'm like constantly um, just kind of just, yeah, overcomplicating things, um, you know, like, <laughs> creatively, um, and with like very grandiose, um, you know, ambitions and vision. Um, just like, you know, I don't know, because I just like I can't, because when you can do that and you pull it off, and um, is you just get such a shot of joy. Um, it's just something I just kind of, yeah, I really feed off of. So, um, so I'm always seeking that out. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, you had. There, there is, there is, a lot of video of you being the wildest of wild girls. <laughs> I mean, is is, is yeah. it? Is, I mean, <laughs> would you go back to that? Would you? Oh, oh my gosh. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if my like my knee hurts like really like a lot right now. <laughs> my right one. Um, we just did this, um, you know, Colbert show with uh, Spike Jones, and I had to climb up on a car like 20 times, and my knee really hurts. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not built like like I used to be for for that kind of uh, uh, you know sort of unbridled exposition. But um, but <laughs> but um, yeah, but I feel it on the inside. That doesn't go away. Like the punk spirit never leaves you. You know. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, actually, that the Colbert thing. I mean, that that had to be choreographed, I think. Yes, <laughs> um, definitely choreographed. But I mean, how much? How much? How much went into that? I mean, 
like, months, days? Well, I mean, we talked about it for a while. I like really twisted Spike's arm to do it. So <laughs> he's one of the busiest men in, in, uh, in show business. I hope everybody's seen this. She was on Colbert singing. Yeah, Good. that was pretty wild. Um, but, uh, but yeah, like, so we talked about it for a while and he was kind of explaining to me like, as a friend, you know, what, like, what was a good idea? And I was like, yeah, but like, you, like, you have to do it, you know? You, I can't just take that information and give it to somebody else. You have to do it. And he was like laughing, like, ha ha, ha ha, like, like nervously laugh, laughing to get like out of it. And then I was like, no, but you have to do it. And he's like, ha ha, okay. <laughs> um, so we had talk, talked about, about it for a while. Um, and, um, but yeah, but like Spike is just like, he's kind of like a, yeah, he's like a creative machine and like, and it really just kind of came together and probably like, you know, I mean, you know, the bulk of it in like the last four days, you know, so Seriously? yeah, yep, yep. So, um, like he, he hadn't even cast the dancers till, you know, like, basically the day before we rehearsals so, so and it you know it was like amazing um uh but yeah but we like we then yeah we went like intense and, and like rehearsed it a lot and and got into it and uh and yeah and did something pretty cool i thought you know um for uh for late night television music you know um, <laughs> so, so um yeah and but i did like it was like it was an idea that i had pretty early on i was like you know like yeah, Brian said something like, oh, we're too old to do music videos. No one wants to watch us like do music videos. <laughs> um, they don't. And... <laughs> but, but that's different. This was different, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You said like a year ago, well, well when we do Woman, it's going to be TV. You're going to get somebody yeah, to direct just... it. It's going to be great. You said yeah. it's a year ago. And yeah, yeah. No, I had year, like that yeah. idea a while back. I was, yeah. like, I was like, how rad would it be to just like, for our music, like it'd kind of be like a music video in, in a way, but it would be like on, you know, we'd do it at a you know, late night show and, and we'd just like try and push the boundaries and do something really cool, so yeah. Well, also, there's music videos get cuts, music videos get edited. Yes. This this was this was all like yeah one shot. We got one shot at it. Yeah. So yeah, which makes the stakes higher, which is like yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so uncomfortable. You know? yeah. <laughs> did did you write that song as an anthem? No, I mean like it really just like I mean Brian can attest to that. Like it just came flooding out. It was just like you know. Yeah, no, it was. No, like, it, was, so, uh, it was just so. She freestyled it. Yeah, she really did. She just went in the booth, yeah. and she usually, you know, uh, some music will be going, and Karen will be in the back of the studio writing and writing, and which is always great to see because most people leave that till the very, very end. But she's always writing, and uh, the music side of it, she was very involved in as well. It was like, you know, looking for a real kind of. Phil Spector kind of sounding thing and stomping and it was something that I said hey listen to this what do you think of this and we messed with it a little bit and turned it up really loud and then she just went into the booth and said I think I might have an idea or something let me see and she just put the headphones on and just started kind of uh, it's like almost like it was stream like, of conscious you just yeah. were just doing it and it and so we basically maybe 10 minutes of recording she stops she comes back in and I think I probably heard some of it, but I was like, just go outside, or just hold on, we're gonna comp. So we start comping and start grabbing parts, and you hear basically, there's, there's pretty much everything that you hear there was something that she did just off the top of her head, but just kind of rearranged in some kind of way, and it sounded like you were saying, woman, woman. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, then it like, made sense. Yeah, yeah, I was like kind of almost like speaking in tongues, like, yeah. sorry not to get witchy, but like, but like, it was like, la, la, you know, it was like, you know, I wasn't, it just wasn't really any like words. And then all of a sudden, like, oh, woman. and I was like, is that, am I saying woman? I'm saying woman, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, and it really just, yeah. And then it, then it, you know, and then it came, became what it was pretty quickly. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, so your subconscious was guiding you? I think so. Yeah. I mean, do you, do you do that speaking in tongues thing to write? Usually? <laughs> no, I mean, so, really. so, so no, a lot I, of songwriters yeah. do just like syllables yeah. come out. Yeah. yeah, not really. You know, like a um, little bit, but like, but that was just like, I was just, um, I was fired up. That was like, that was the end of like, that was the end of like the night sort of situation, and I was feeling quite fired up. Um, and I was ready to do something like that. Um, I don't know. I just like, I was like, because it's kind of one of the, like, the most, sort of up-tempo mm -hmm. songs on the record too. Like I was like, I was like fired up. I was like, let's do this. And I didn't know what it was going to be until it came out. So yeah. It, it, it worked. <laughs> OK, cool. The, uh, <laughs> um, 
Brian, I wanted to, I'm sure there are production geeks here wanting to ask you about every sound on every one of your records. Um, but um, I wanted to ask, uh, well, talk about Daniele Luppi, who is the secret string arranger on this. Because um, you've worked with him before on the Rome album. Yeah. Um, and this, it kind of continues some of that, it seems to me. Yeah, yeah. When I first moved to LA, um, I picked up an album by this guy named Daniele Lupe. Um, and he was an Italian guy who had come to LA to do soundtrack stuff. And it was a really small little album. And I looked it up, found him, and then we shared our love for Italian film soundtracks and sounds and all this stuff. And he was only a couple years older than me. And we got together and talked about making an album, which eventually turned into Rome. But the first thing I said, well, I'm messing with this album right now that could use some help. And it was um, the Gnarls Barkley album, the first one. And he helped do some arrangements on that. And then almost every time after that, I almost would just, I got to see what it would sound like if, if, if Daniel um, would sit with me on it or, or try some different arrangements here and there. But he's just a, he's a great arranger, composer, all those things, but sound-wise, he just kind of gets it. And I'm always looking for cinematic sounding things, and so we always work together on things like that. And we've written songs together like we did on Rome. And yeah, once again, and, and I introduced Karen to Daniel before we worked together, I think, right? Yeah. And he did an album with the Parquet Courts maybe two years ago, yeah, something like that. Yeah. And yeah, I was like, I'm about to go in with Karen, but we're not going in yet, so you, I guess work with her first. <laughs> but, uh, and, and then eventually I wound up doing the park, working with the parquet courts myself. So there's a weird kind of in the family thing going on there. But yeah, Daniel's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, I actually wanted to add, I mean, that, that early 2000s period seems to have set up a whole web of relationships that you still have. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, not just the yeah, yeah, yeah guys, but, um, Vampire Weekend, um, I mean, was there a feeling at that time of like, we're forging this movement together? No, like there wasn't that. <laughs> it was like, it was, it was, it was shock, like, yeah, because I remember that question came up a lot, you know, um, back in that um, time. And it was like, I guess it was still like considered like postmodernist time, um, <laughs> and which basically meant like, we just questioned everything. Like, and to like, and it was like, a sh I re that's like, I don't regret a lot, but I, I do regret that there was like that sort of, you know, frame of mind where you're just like, you know, this is like a really special moment, but like we like questioned it because like everyone was comparing like that era to like, you know, the sort of late seventies, early eighties New York, you know, sort of scene that like was had all the the greats, um, like Patty and Lou and and the Ramones and et cetera, et cetera. But like, um, so like, so, so, um, and I guess those, those guys and Blondie and all that, but like, I think, I mean, they hung, they all hung out, right? They were all like sort of, well, like, seen, like only one club. It was one club, <laughs> right? Okay. Um, and so like, but like for us, like, you know, we had like little, like we had little clicks, but like we, it was still kind of disjointed, you know, like back then. And it was funny because it was really just like, to like, you know, um, and, and I think there was like, and I was like pretty competitive, I think. And like, and I was like, one of the only gals like in a boys club. So, um, so um, yeah, so we didn't connect with like a lot of our contemporary bands at that time, like Strokes or, you know, LCD or, you know, um, gosh, I don't know. There's just like, there's a, there's a, there, there were a lot of them um, until like about 10 years later. And then now we're like, in 10 years later, we were like in like around 2009 or 2010, like we are all like super bonding and like, <laughs> it took like, a while. Yeah, yeah, it took a while. Like you know, um, maybe it's because our moment was over and we're just all like, all right, like, <laughs> like cool. We're like, this is the. It was great, wasn't it? You know, but like, uh, <laughs> but like at the time, we're like sort of like you know, kind of questioning it. Like, is this like, is this a movement? Like, is this for real? Like, is this as cool as it was before? Like. So, um, yeah, so I think, you know, but it's, I still, I think we still had a blast anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> that moment will never end. It will, yeah, it will never end in my heart, so. Um, I got, what, did it, what did it feel like that Beyonce singing your melody? Oh, yeah, that was, yeah, that was, that was crazy. Um, yeah, that was crazy. That was so strange how that, like, I was like, 
like my husband was making some spaghetti bon- like bongole spaghetti with clams at home like our son was like a year old and like Diplo like texted me like yo um you know uh Beyonce's like yeah, oh yeah Beyonce's like gonna cover maps like tomorrow is that cool like I was like what like you know like <laughs> this had been happening like you know for a while and he just like dropped that on me like and I was like uh I guess I was like okay sure I guess so um and uh yeah like the video came out like a week later <laughs> um but I guess it had been in the works but like but uh but yeah it was it was really surreal it was like it was um and it was so cool because actually I was here when that like kind of dropped in New York City because I'm I live in LA now now and I was on like the subway and it was like a New York moment because like you know the subway was really crowded and then like the doors open and everyone was like kind of streaming out of it and it was just me and this girl and she had um her headphones on she's like um hold up they don't love you like I love you you know <laughs> they don't love you like it was just like felt like it was just me and her and like in the subway car <laughs> um so so like I was like wow all right, that's, 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 that was a New York moment for me, so um, yeah, it was pretty cool. Wow. Um, we're going to ask you guys to have some questions. They're going to turn up the house lights a tiny bit, and there will be ushers ah. if, you, <laughs> if you raise your hand. Um, so um, let's, let's hope that people with the microphones can get to you. There's somebody over here. And thanks for waiting so we can all hear you and YouTube can hear you. Hello? There you go. Uh, uh, Aaron, my wife and I saw you perform at St. Anne's like years ago oh, wow. at this like crazy I, it wasn't really a musical. It wasn't. It was a, this performance. Psycho opera, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was yeah. wondering if you had any plans to do something like that again, or. <laughs> yeah, or oh yeah, yeah. We wrote that. How that we, evolved, etc. Oh, because I had never really heard anything after that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my style. It's just like you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So that that that's um, Stop the Virgins, um, and um, we uh, yeah, I, we, that music was written in 2005. We did it at St. Anne's in 2011, and then um, Sydney Opera House the following year. Um, and yeah, I still get asked when when are you gonna release that music? And <laughs> um, any day now, like hopefully. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, but there's no like, there's no yeah, there's no concrete plans. But any day now. Thank you for seeing that, by the way. Yeah, yeah, thank you. You think you're releasing visuals too? Um, you know, we like, we like, yeah, we documented the whole thing, so we'll see. Yeah, I'll see how it goes. Somebody back there? Is that a raised hand? Well, I mean, that's that's one. I mean, you do so many sort of projects. How do you how do you decide? I mean, on what to do? Or, yeah, um, on what the next what next uh, impulse will be. Yeah, um, I, I'm still working on on Stop the Virgins, really. <laughs> no, I mean, like, yeah, I don't know, like, um, yeah, I don't know. I just, uh, yeah, I just like, I always want to get into something new, and things just like, you know, like, it's kind of the law of attraction, don't you think, to a certain degree? Like how much of like there's not that much that like you know um, that that I don't know it just feels like you meet someone and or you do something and something just you know kind of attract you just you know kind of stumble upon it or connect with something and it just never seems like it's really up to you to a certain degree like it kind of it just seems like one thing leads to another really you know so yeah I have to ask you another how does it feel question um, performing on the Oscars. Oh yeah, that had yeah. to be a weird situation. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that was like that was so awesome because like yeah, I mean because um, we got to be like a part of like you know the machinery of the show, um, which was like insane. So like yeah, we had like um, yeah, we just got to see how the whole thing worked, you know, um, and. Uh, and yeah, it's just like the best people watching that you'll you know ever experience <laughs> in your, your entire life. But yeah, it was it was insane. Is there any questions? Hi, hey, uh, congratulations on an awesome album. Really enjoying it, listening to it a lot. Um, the way you got together independently without a label and the whole infrastructure and apparatus of what 
musicians deal with, with labels and such. Uh, it seems like a special thing. It seems like something that really made the album what it is. Is this a movement, a common practice? Is this only something afforded to people who have already made it? Um, just kind of talk maybe about that a little bit as far as the industry view of that. Hmm. Um, well, I've, I've never um, worked with an artist through anything but the artist. I've never had to deal with a label or talk to a label about the record I was making. Congratulations. Um, but mostly the, because the beginning, nobody was paying attention to the records I was doing. So that's how I started doing it. There was no label who would sign it until something came out, something did it. And then it went pretty quick because the, you know, the first, yeah, I think the first album I did as an artist after the Grey Album thing was Gnarls Barkley and had a huge hit on it. So nobody said anything. And then from then on, I just kind of just kept doing what I was doing. But I remember when Karen and I first got together after the, after the phone call and talked, <laughs> um, there was this thing. I, I mean, I'm still on some crazy contract from 2002. And, and, and she was in the middle of something, too. So there's this stress that it stays with you. But it never really affects you as an artist if you don't want it to. It just depends on what you're trying to do. What are your goals and your methods? And the peop those people kind of find each other. It's never. I've never had a conversation about a label or any of that stuff with any of the artists until you're almost done. Like, okay, who are we turning this into or who's doing it? Never met label people and it's, it's no real offense. I mean, I have a little label myself now, so it's like, it's just, <laughs> it's just one of those things, you know, but it only really affects it. I, I, I kind of think it's, it's I've, I've met a lot of younger artists now. I used to only work with older ones. Now I'm old and so they're young. And <laughs> you get into one situation, either you make a record and then you sell it to someone who likes it. If you're really good though, or you have this thing where people see this potential in it, you get stuck behind the eight ball because then somebody pays you to make a record. And then you never get out on the other side of it a lot of times. You've, got, you've taken money, now you're making something, and there's people who are gonna say, well, this isn't what I paid for, or things like that. But if you get on the other side of it and you make stuff, and then people pay as you go, you can make whatever you want to make. So I've always, I've never been in a situation where I've taken money and then made a record. I always make a record and then we sell it to them and go from there. But again, that's a real choice. I have no family to support or anything like that, so I can kind of do that. <laughs> but it's, so I can't say, I know creatively for me, I think which is, it's obvious which is better, but it can be tough, especially if you have three, four people in a band, it can get really, really difficult, but for us, you know, there was never even a, a, we didn't have to even talk about it. It was just an obvious thing. We just went in and just started working. And I did know that she was not under contract anymore, which just meant that, I don't know what it meant. I, I mean, I, I know it was easier for you. Yeah, but there's sometimes it, more red tape when there's like, yeah. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Or the thing would have been, if we would have made it, it would have been like somebody might have had a, a, a say as to who owned it or whatever, but it wouldn't have really affected, affected what the creative we, side. Yeah. Like that, maybe. Yeah, but like, I mean, I do think that, um, yeah, like, you know, we are fortunate because we've, we came, both Brian and I came up in a time when like, you still could like really establish yourself as like, you know, um, sort of uh, an act that sticks, you know, um, and, uh, and we, yeah, and, and so we, we have a fan base and we have a, an audience who will be interested in when we do something new, and so that is definitely like you know fortunate you know for us you know uh, that we did, you know that we kind of built that you know for ourselves in a time where you still could build that build that relatively easily. I think it's definitely more challenging now you know for artists to do that, um, for new artists to do that and stuff. So yeah, it did feel like a privilege in a way you know to be able to work on something and have people interested in hearing it. So um, but like but uh, but yeah, I don't know is that. Address your question. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it, it seems like it's the people at the very bottom, you know, submitting stuff to SoundCloud mm -hmm. and hoping somebody out there clicks, and then the people who have sort of come through the other side, as as you have, are are, are in the same place now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think some of the worst things that can happen is somebody starts listening too early. I mean, you put something on SoundCloud and it starts to work, all of a sudden, you think 10,000 people are listening. That's nothing in the grand scheme of things, but if you're in your bedroom, it's a lot. And yeah. I, I've met young kids who are stressing about 
their third song ever. <laughs> and because they have, you know, 20,000 people talking about them and they're checking and looking and I'm going, oh no, this is never, this is going to be bad yeah. because you just That's can't, it's, it's just no good to be that self-conscious as you're getting to where you're going. It's just, it's, that's supposed to happen after you've already got the luxuries of, of a fan base and some, something, yeah. some time. You can take a year off or something, I don't know. But yeah, I don't know where it goes from here though. But I've, I've started to see that in some of the younger mm -hmm. people I've uh, talked to who are doing well, well, yeah. relatively. Get rid of the comment, don't read the comments. Yeah, don't, yeah. yeah. don't read your reviews. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Karen, you, you overhauled yeah, yeah, yeahs three or four times. You know, you, you switched from guitars to power chords to synthesizers to the whole shebang. Yeah. Um, I mean, that was that to keep yourself out of your comfort zone? I think so, yeah. And, and unfortunately for Nick, I'm out of his comfort zone too. <laughs> <laughs> you seem um, to take to it pretty well. Yeah. You're after, still talking too. Yeah, we are. We're, 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 we're best friends. We're a family. Um, but, um, but yeah, like, yeah. But it wasn't easy. It was really tough, yeah. Especially... Um, the second record was really, yeah, that was, that was, yeah, I still, yeah, I think I have post-traumatic stress disorder from that second record. <laughs> I mean, like, the, they call it the sophomore slump, but it's, like, it's, 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 it's perilous. It's definitely perilous. Um, yeah, because, like, also, um, I think that was, like, a transition, not only, like, for us, but also for, like, it just sent, like, the industry and, like, and, like, it was, like, a major change that was happening at that time where, you know, it went from, like, oh yeah, there's still like trends, like, you know, garage rock trend or like, you know, this kind of thing to like it being like, there's no trends anymore. There's like, you know, it's, it's just all, of, it's anything. And it was really hard to, you know, get our heads around that and be like, well, then what's next? So I'm like, well, let's just not do the same thing. Let's do something different. I don't know what it is. Let's just do something different. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, you, and, and you did. Yeah. Um, which is, which is, w w w did you start feeling pressure uh, from fans? I mean, did you start no. internalizing that, thinking, oh, will the fans like this? No, no. <laughs> Sorry, fans, but yeah, no. I, like, I mean, we lost a lot of fans probably in, like, in that, in, from the first to the second record because we didn't do, like, sort of, yeah, that, that, that thing we were doing. Um, but I just figured, like, you know, um, that, you know, like, I just, yeah, it's just, it, you have to, as an artist, you, yeah, you, you have to just sort of um, kind of just please yourself and know that you can stand behind it, you know, and otherwise you're in trouble. So yeah, so yeah, yeah we tried not to do that. Yeah, um, I was also thinking other one, one other rock critic-y thing, which is the way your lyrics work often to me is different from storytelling, different from confession. It's sort of like an incantation almost. Oh, interesting. Um, I guess you don't think of it that way, if, <laughs> no, if it's interesting. No. <laughs> no, 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 I mean, I don't, yeah, I just like, I don't really, yeah, I, I don't really know, I just don't, yeah, I don't, I don't know, I don't, yeah, I don't think about it so much, I just, uh, <laughs> I, um, I like, the only thing I think about is like, I just try and keep it like, you know, um, especially more recently, simple, you know, because um, like some of my favorite music was like, you know, maybe some, like, I just like I got really into like some doo wop music, you know, from the 50s, and and I was just like, wow, like, you know, it's kind of like, you know, also just like films like um, back in the day when they weren't allowed to say any like like I don't know, anyway, it's just like it, it, there's just I just I just was so like marveling at the simplicity of like the lyrics, but how much like was said that was being unsaid. And like in the mo like just how pure the emotion was, and and so like yeah, so that's kind of yeah, that's kind of how I like to, to write lyrics, yeah. The the other thing about you 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 do a lot with nonverbal sounds. Oh right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah yeah yeah. Beautiful I things. I mean. Yeah. So I mean, I mean, I will never listen to the word uh huh again, the right. same way after Black Tongue. All right. So, <laughs> nice. But but I mean, what is that? Are, are you thinking about? Just sound? Actually, the way that I started writing music with the AIS was with um, this um, toy megaphone. Um, I don't know if I don't know if this is readily known, but like it, it was like yeah, it was like from a toy shop, and it had like the alien sound. It had like you know the like the like the super deep devil sound, and, it, and then it had this like you know kind of just very distorted sort of yeah like kind of 
uh, like kind of uh, what's the staticky sound, and and I did all the demos like with that in the beginning because like because I just like I was like really like I just love I mean because I just it totally like freed me I just felt like so I like felt like um, like yeah like it just like it just turned my voice into this other thing and like and I was like in a way it was like strange because I was like quite detached from my own voice through it but like but I think it kind of led to what you're talking about which is just like you know I just like created all these wild kind of sounds and and like inflections through it because yeah because i was just like hearing when you hear your voice with like certain effects like it, it's amazing you know things that you can hear that you wouldn't hear just like if it's completely dry so like so i started all those like yeah yeah demos like with my toy megaphone <laughs> and like and that's like in a way how i crafted a lot of like my sort of i guess like my 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 carano yeah yeah's persona sounds <laughs> you know so wow yeah um my my timer here is blinking away, um, so we got. To, is there any one last question? Oh boy, <laughs> uh, I don't know. Um, how about you, way in the back? So, uh, what about a what about a gal in the yeah, this gal over that. here? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Oh, you, yeah, yeah, I'm like, right, you, you're the stripes. <laughs> oh, right, yeah, that's you, that's you right there. Third row. <laughs> you. Good spotting. Oh, oh, she's like, oh, okay, she's like just waiting for the thing. <laughs> <laughs> I thought she was like behind me. I know how to talk, don't worry. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> sorry. Uh, Karen and Brian, first I just want to say you guys have created some of my favorite songs of all time, so thank you for that. Awesome, thank you. Um, I have two questions for you. First, I think when you guys started making music, like people still listen to CDs. Um, so how have technology changes in the music industry, like streaming and media, affected you as artists, first of all? And then second, can you please explain the 2,500 pound rock? <laughs> I'll take the That's first our, question. Okay, okay, you take the first question. <laughs> I got that second one, yeah. Um, I think that the streaming thing I was really against when it first happened, but there's nothing you can do about it. But downloading was a weird thing because now it's gone so quickly. I think the thing about streaming is that... <sighs> <laughs> if the nature of what you're listening to has to do with repetition, as in, you get paid the more someone listens, not how much they feel and how much they love it or who around them, what, what it makes them, what it, how it defines them to be a fan of something or how it feels in any way, if it is purely the numbers. I mean, the most listened to stuff for me is stuff I go to sleep to. So, it, it, and that, I like that music, but that's the thing I'm gonna listen to over and over again. There's a lot of types of music that if you start looking at the harshness of it or what it's doing, it's not meant to be listened to over and over and over again. So I don't know what the effect is yet, but I do feel like if, if it's not convincing people to believe or to believe in what you're doing, but if you're convincing people to listen to something over and over and over again, it's gonna start affecting the way stuff sounds or it's gonna all start to be something that is pleasant on the ear or something that is able to be listened to over and over and over again in some kind of way. It's going to, all these algorithms and things like that. So I think, I think it's a little early to tell, but I don't, I don't feel positive about what that's going to be, but there'll probably be something else. I don't know. Um, and then The Rock. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I was just trying to like keep The Rock alive, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> the Rock is dead right now, guys. Um, so, you know. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult to describe the rock otherwise. So. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, can we leave it at that? <laughs> <laughs> Again, I guess we, I think keeping the rock alive is a good place to put that stinger on it. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you all for listening so attentively. Thank you, Karen O'Brien. <laughs>